Um, so yeah, I'll just go through my hundred findings and, um, you know, and, and just, I, I just want people to keep in mind, like, what's the most likely scenario that these data patterns evidence an abridgment, right? So that's the proto-orthodox hypothesis that Marcin came in, Marcin had canonical Luke, and then he chopped it up. He cut it down, right? Um, or is it more reasonable that Marcin was the early, has attests an earlier, simpler form of this text that was later expanded into canonical Luke? Right. That's again, all scholars agree. Uh, Luke and Marcion are basically, you know, different versions of the same text. It's just which one is earlier and which one's later. That's the only bone right. of contention. So right. as I go through these data patterns, just for your here, you know, audience, just, you know, ask yourself, like, what what makes more sense just in terms of the data? Um, you know, Mark Goodacre from Duke was recently on Jacob's channel and I, I asked him a question in the in the live stream. You know, like, have you read the recent scholarship on Gospel Marcion? And his response was something along the lines of, well, I don't think the evidence supports that, you know, Marcion's gospel is earlier, something like that. And, you know, like, in some ways, this presentation is a rebuttal. Like, uh, I'm going to give Goodacre and everybody else out there. Here's a hundred ways. Too many EBA concerts, man. You got to get back to the books. The evidence. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, what about you Good Acre, that, that, was a, that was a good acre joke because he goes to so many ABBA concerts. He loves it. Oh, Aaron. really? Okay. Yeah. He was I actually love too. last like, night. Yeah. He posted on Facebook at the concert. I was okay. like, man, he's <laughs> yeah. always posting ABBA concert yeah. videos. Yeah, while he's that doing was, Dancing joke. Queen, I am compiling. <laughs> yeah, while you're going here. to ABBA concerts, we're here reading the text. So, yeah. Yeah, so I would say Goodacre hasn't actually looked seriously at the evidence. And when he does, if, if he ever does, the evidence is overwhelming. It's not even close. So here, again, here are 100 things. Like, so if Goodacre wants to rebut this, great. Or if anybody else wants to rebut this, great. But, um, you know, and, and again, look in my open science book for, for validation of this, right? And you often find like visualizations, even for this right here, Luke and Single Traditions. I have like nice charts and graphs showing this. And not only showing that it's true of like one edition, like Roth's edition of Marcion's Gospel, but it's true in every single edition, right? There are eight major Greek editions now, and you see the same data patterns in all eight. So like, you know, Matthias Klinghart's reconstruction of Marcion's Gospel is 13,000 words. It's pretty long. Roth's is 4,000 words. So that's that's a huge gap between those. But Dune's about 7,000. That's where, close to where I'm, I'm at. It was kind of in the middle, which I think that's on the right track. But all these patterns, if you look at them, they're consistent across all editions. It doesn't matter who's reconstructing Marcin's gospel because the data clearly points, you know, in these directions pretty much for all hundred of these features. So you're, you're gonna see cleaner data. Like if you compare Roth's and Klinghart's, Roth's data will be much cleaner because Klinghart puts a lot of stuff that's from canonical Luke and he puts it in Marcin's gospel and that muddies the picture. It, it, it you know, makes the data ambiguous. Um, so Roth is a good starting point in terms of clean data. Uh, Harnack as well, even though they're only 4,000 words. So they're, they're 3,000 words short, but the 4,000 words is much cleaner data than what you get in Klinghart and Nickelodeon. So like, which is not to say that Klinghart and Nickelodeon were wrong for trying to do a complete restoration of Marcin's Gospel. Like that's what we need to do. That's the goal. And we may not ever get like 100% there. We may only get like 90% there, but that's okay. Like even with the canonical text, we, we never get to 100%. Like maybe we get to like 98% of what the canonical text was, looking at all the manuscripts and all the variations. Like we don't know exactly what yeah. the canonical forms of these texts were because as soon as, he, you know, people start copying stuff and things start translating, that you're going to have diversity within within the textual tradition. So there there is no perfect canonical form of the text. Uh, everything that we do is a reconstruction. The, the only question is how how, you know, close can we get in terms of accuracy on our reconstructions. And if we can get to like 98% accuracy in the canonical text, I think we might be able to get to like 90%, you know, give or take with the Marcionite stuff. The problem is right now, like most of the discourse is around 50%. Like, you know, Roth is, and Harnack are like 4,000 words, but if the text was actually about 7,500 words, then then Roth and Harnack are all off the bat, they're only about like getting to 55% of what the text actually was. Where Klinghart, you know, I, I liken this like shooting the moon, like Roth, if, you know, if Roth was trying to land, uh, you know, a lunar, you know, uh, spacecraft, uh, you know, a spacecraft on the moon, uh, he barely made it out of the atmosphere, right? He didn't, he didn't get there. Like it's well short and he knows that, like it's, there's just a lot of stuff that's missing. And uh, you know, there's just, just gaps where Klinghart and Nickelodeon, they overshot the moon, mm. but we can learn a lot from how they overshot the moon. Yeah. But, but, but Dune and I were pretty, close to there and i think vincent is is 
coming around about basically the same kind of position. So I think we're starting to see the emergence of what I would say is a scholarly consensus that Marcion's gospel was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 7,000 to 8,000 words. That's a scientifically reasonable position. And, you know, the, the, the challenge then is like, how close can we get to that? Anyway, that's, that's kind of, that may be too much of an aside, but I hope that gives viewers some context sure. that like, uh, you know, yeah, it's a hypothetical text in some sense, but not fundamentally different uh, in terms of doing a reconstruction. And um, it's it's not hypothetical in the sense of like, we're just imagining this, like we have over 700 attestations to the text by over 15 different right. authors in antiquity. So yeah. everybody knew this text. <laughs> we have, it's our first, Absolutely. you know, yeah. first text where you have a gospel commentary there, you know, and you have attestations in Armenian in Syriac in Arabic, yeah. Latin, Greek, right? Th this was a very broadly uh, known and circulated text. It was suppressed, right? And then the question then becomes like, well, if it was suppressed, can we reconstruct it? Of course we can reconstruct it, right? You reconstruct it from the quotations and allusions and paraphrases, as well as the vestiges that are in the manuscripts, right? So like Julian the Apostate wrote a treatise against Christians that was suppressed and destroyed, but Cyril of Alexandria and Augustine both wrote extensively against it and quoted it. So if we use their quotations, we can actually reconstruct a fair amount of what Emperor Julian wrote. Same thing with Celsus, right? We don't have Celsus's original true doctrine, but Origen wrote an right. extensive 10 book commentary on it and he quotes now, extensively enough, right. from it. So, you know, we, you know, nobody would say, oh, we can't know what Celsus thought. Bull crap. Of course we can know what Celsus thought because Origen's quoting Got the it. reconstruction right here. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so this is not a fool's errand. Of course, yeah. we can reconstruct this text just because the primary witnesses we have to it are secondary because, you know, they're, they would had this text in front of them and they're quoting it. But just because we don't have a manuscript just of Marcion's gospel, that's right. not an excuse. And that's what all the recent scholarship from the last 10 years, looking carefully at the patristic attestations by Tertullian, Adamantius Dialogue, Epiphanius, and, and many others, but also looking at the manuscripts, because often like the, especially in Syriac and old Latin, the manuscripts actually line up with yeah. what the Marcionite witnesses are saying against the canonical form of the text. Right. So Klinghart's found this over and over and over again. You find like traces or vestiges in the man, in the canonical Luke manuscripts of the Marcionite readings. Hmm. So there's, there's a huge amount of cross contamination that's happening from the earliest years in these traditions. So the, the, the question is like, how do you reconstruct and then how do you decontaminate? That's, that's the challenge yeah. facing scholars right now. All right. Uh, so yeah, here, here's number one, uh, Luke and single tradition. So these are the things that only in Luke's gospel and not in Mark and Matthew. So it turns out if you look at Marcin's gospel, like most of the stuff not in Marcin's gospel at all. So what makes more sense? Did Marcin just get rid of all the stuff that was unique to Luke while using Luke or, you know, or get rid of most of it? Or was that stuff added in later? Uh, Right. There's a non-random surplus of synoptic triple tradition. So if you find a tradition in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, vast majority of those are in Marcion's gospel, right? When there's alignment between the three. If there's a double tradition, Luke and Matthew align, that tends to, they're, they're, that more often than not tends to be in Marcion's gospel and at a higher rate than in the canonical text. Same thing with Q traditions. If you go through like Kloppenberg's edition of Q and you just like look verse by verse at all the Q traditions, like about 55% of those uh, are in Marcion's gospel. Hmm. So like if you take any random verse in canonical Luke, it, there's a 40% chance it shows up in Marcion's gospel, right? But if you look at Q traditions, that goes up to 55%. So the Q traditions are overrepresented significantly uh, within this text. The same thing applies to dubious Q traditions. So if you, again, look at Kloppenberg and, and others, critical edition of Q, there's, you know, many passages and verses and so on that they mark as doubtful. So if you just look at those, 60% of the time, those are in Marcin's gospel, again, versus like 40% of what's in canonical Luke. Um, there's a systematic lack of Mark and traditions. So there's like extended sections in Mark that are not in Marcin's gospel. And yet in other parts of Mark, there's perfect like passage by passage parallels, even more faithful than what you find between Mark and Matthew. So at some point, Marcion's gospel is more faithful to Mark than Matthew is, but in other parts, it's completely detached from Mark's gospel, right? Wow. So th this is why I think a multi-stage, uh, you know, hypothesis for Mark has to, has to, is the only reasonable explanation of the data. Uh, when you find unique overlaps between Mark and Luke, uh, you know, and there are several of these, you know, the, 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 in the longer ending, you find some of these, but in, a, in several other places as well, like uh, the woman who gives a, the widow's mite 
that's only in Mark and Luke. Well, but it's not in Marcion's gospel. So like if you count up all of these things that are unique overlaps between Mark and Luke, most of those uh, are not in Marcion's gospel. They're disproportionately Makes missing. Sense. Uh, textual sources, you know, so canonical Luke advertises it's using a lot of sources. If you look at Marcin's gospel carefully, it looks like it's only using about two sources. It doesn't look like it's pulling from a lot of different sources. Travel references. So Marcin's gospel, right? Marcin, according to his later detractors, was a ship owner, very well traveled, wealthy. Um, you know, so what, what makes more sense? Marcin took out pretty much like all the travel references, almost all the, well, not all of them, but, you know, a high, high percentage of the travel references or that canonical Luke added in a, a bunch of travel references. And, you know, these are like back and forth trips, uh, you know, in, in the classical literature, you have the uh, exitus reditus, right? Where a hero goes off on a journey, the exitus, the leaving, and then the reditus, the return. That trope occurs again and again and again in canonical Luke, even in the story of uh, the prodigal son. He goes off on a journey, returns right? Off on a journey, return. Spirits do this in canonical Luke. Jesus's parents do this in canonical Luke. You you never find that in Marcion's gospel. There's no there and back again, a hobbit's journey in Marcion's gospel, but it keeps happening again and again in canonical Luke. Uh, place names. Again, so many geographical references in canonical Luke, hardly any in Marcion's gospel. What makes more sense there? Marcion hated to mention place names or that these were later imposed in the interest of creating like a, a various militudinous, you know, like a, a historic, like fictional historicized uh, account. 